This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 164, recorded on December 30th, 2011. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. We're at the end of 2011, and joining me today to talk about the year's virology stories from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. How are you doing, Alan? Doing okay. You have a good uh, week here up there in New England? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, The weather wasn't too bad, and uh, my daughter is visiting her grandparents for the week, so... Well, that's cool. Yeah, it's been awfully quiet around here. All right. Getting ready for the college days, you know. That's right. Yeah, that's a little ways off. <laughs> Empty nest. Also joining me today, from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, fellas. How you doing? How you doing? Have a good holiday week? Uh, indeed. We've had uh, a whole house full, and as I said, I think before, up to my eyeballs and grandchildren. It's cool. It's been wonderful. Yeah, it's been great. I don't hear any noise there. They must all be gone. Uh, it's nap time. Uh, yeah, well, you know, we're down to just two families, and uh, the kids know I'm doing this, plus it's nap time, blah, blah, blah. You guys go to Satchel's this week? Uh, I just had leftover Satchel's pizza for lunch, and we were at Satchel's last night, and then we were at Satchel's about a week ago. So, nice. yes, we've had our time at Satchel's. <laughs> I figure when you have guests, that's where you go. Absolutely. Cool. Well, I still got that sticker you got me. Yeah. I look at it all the time. <laughs> it's very cool. All right, we are here on the last Friday in 2011. And this is the year I learned to say 2011 and not 2011. Right. Is that correct, now to do 2011? Uh, well, I don't know if there's a correct or incorrect, but I think most people now say 2011. Yeah, I like it. It's a lot easier than 2000, and because we used to say 1958, right? Right. Okay. Well, I, I wasn't around in that year, but yeah. <laughs> I know. I just came out of my head 58. I don't know what happened. I wasn't even born then. Well, I had been born, but wasn't in 58. Anyway, uh, we are going to do our traditional, by now traditional. Uh, we didn't do one in, in 08. Actually, I think you did. You did? I was looking back at that. Well, let's uh, see, because I thought we hadn't been doing it that, that long, so I'm not sure. Yeah, it doesn't look. Tapped, yeah, we did. I guess we we had enough to pick from. Hmm. Twiv thirteen. Me right. and, me and Alan. Hey. Right. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? Cool. So this is the fourth one of these. This is the fourth guys. one. I think it's cool. I like doing them. It makes you think back and look forward and uh, review stuff. So that's what we'll do today. Yeah. We did fifth. We released fifty episodes in twenty eleven. So that's cool. We only took two weeks off. We had 27 guests, which I think is pretty neat. Yeah. yeah. It's over half. So we're exposing everyone. And a guest is anyone other than me, Alan, Richard, Dixon. Yep. Oh, we should consider Dixon the guest, right? Yeah, at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we did nine road trips. That's a lot. That's a ton of road trips. Yeah. yeah. Rich and I did a couple together. And so it's been a great year for TWIV. And we, we thank everybody for listening, because if you aren't listening, I don't know if we do it or not. What do you think? Well, if nobody uh, were if listening. If nobody was listening, no. No, I don't, I don't think we would do it. Okay. it we, well, at least we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't use the same language in doing it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we would feel freer to swear, I think. Yeah. So anyway, we have lots of listeners. We thank you all. And, and we thank our guests. I guess, mm -hmm. yeah, all 27 of them. And that includes people we've had individually on Skype and also on some of our road trips we had two or three guests. And we'll continue to do that next year. We have already a guest lined up for January. We have uh, at least two road trips lined up, three, I think. So and in 2012, we're going to try and raise some serious money. So maybe when we do road trips, we can all go. Cool. It'll be fun. Okay, 10 stories from 2011. And uh, the first one, I these are in no order, particular order. 
the ones that went on to the list, I put up a list at the beginning of the week, and and I put the first one on because it's something we talked about a lot. The retrovirus XMRV, chronic fatigue syndrome, and prostate cancer. We did four TWIVs on this in 2011. And, and Rich, you say here we first did it in the fall of '09. Yeah, I went over the whole archive, <laughs> and the first uh, the first XMRV episode was TWIV 50 in September of '09 on prostate cancer, and there have been 14 episodes <clears throat> total. Where, wow. oh, oh, since then, uh, when we've discussed XMRV. Well, it's and not guess, every day uh, somebody this, somebody uh, claims to discover a new human retrovirus. Sure. Yeah. So I remember that first episode. It was myself and Jason Rodriguez, who was who is a postdoc in Steve Goff's lab. Right, I remember listening to that. And the virus had been discovered already uh, previously, and they were working on it in the Goff lab. And uh, so I asked him if he'd like to come and talk about it. So he did. And we talked mainly about, I think, Ela Singh's paper showing um, the presence of of ant, uh, antigen, viral antigen in malignant prostate tissue. Right. And I, I distinctly remember a week later he came back and he, he was just at a Cold Spring Harbor meeting and he'd heard about uh, this group who said that it, the XMRV was also associated with chronic fatigue syndrome. I was like, wow, it's amazing. A week after that, just a little reminiscence here, I went to see Ian Lipkin, and I said, hey, did you hear about this XMRV and CFS? And he waved his hands and he said, I'm not getting involved in that. <laughs> <laughs> right. There we go. <laughs> so in, in 2011... He got involved in that. He got involved. Big time. And yeah, we'll come back to that. Yeah. Now, the first twiv was a conversation I had with Dave Tuller who is a journalist, professor at Berkeley, who writes often for the Times, the New York Times, and he covered uh, the CFS story quite a bit. And by then we were already having serious doubts about this whole thing, right? Yeah, so by then there were a lot of negative studies, right? There had been the original uh, Lombardi et al. 2009 science paper. Uh, The Low and Alter paper had been published, but virtually no one else was confirming the findings, so there were a lot of doubts. And people were looking in places that you'd really expect to see a human retrovirus and just not finding it. Right. I don't remember how I got in touch with Dave Tuller. He probably emailed me and said he was going to be in New York, so I invited him up and we recorded this conversation, uh, which was mainly about science and journalism, but we did touch on CFS and XMRV. And this is interesting. He did talk a lot about the CDC's role uh, in XMRV and CFS or I should just say in CFS in general. And after we recorded, I sent it to him, and he said, could you cut all the stuff about the CDC out? He said, because I really need to look into it better. I'm not sure. Hmm. So I cut it out, and then he wrote this long article, of course, which I posted, in which he did all the research, and there it is. So I thought that was really good that he decided he'd better look into it before talking about it publicly. So that's that's good. good journalism, right? Yes, absolutely. So that's TWIV 119. Uh, The next one we did was 123. We looked at a paper or several papers that showed that the published integration sites of XMRV in prostate tumors turned out to be contaminants, or at least some of them turned out to be contaminants. Well, the only only published integration sites. Yes, there was one paper from one of the authors is Bob Silverman. As he wrote to us, he said he doesn't study integration sites, so it was a collaboration with another lab. And they had sequenced the uh, integration sites and said, aha, here we have XMRV integrated into human DNA in a prostate tumor. Uh, But the paper we talked about on 123 uh, said, no, these are contaminants. They're from a cell line. Right, because you you saw exactly the same integration site in the cell line and in multiple patient samples, which is... That's ridiculous. Right. That's There's no way that would have happened. Yep. So more doubt being sowed by that time. Then 123, 
the title uh, among the the title was contaminated prostates absolute truth and bleached worms and the contaminated prostates uh, this was more analysis of integration sites it's another study which showed more contamination this is from greg towers right and then uh well along this time a number of labs had been publishing that um there were issues with PCR kits. There was there were contamination issues, and then finally, in my view, a really important paper which we talked about on one thirty six, which found that XMRV is a recombinant retrovirus that arose during passage of a human prostate tumor in nude mice in the nineteen nineties. Right, and that was at the same time that of the. Uh a you know, phylogenetic analysis showing that all of the sequences of XMRV that had been published were essentially this recombinant. It didn't show the kind of diversity that, that you should see in a retrovirus if it were actually out there infecting people. Right. It was an amazing and an expression of concern from Science Magazine. That's right. Yes. Yeah. That was an amazing paper, this recombinant origin, which was from Coffin and Vinay Patak because they were able to track down a lot of the original uh, cell lines that had been made from the prostate tumor and reconstruct both halves of XMRV as they arose from the murine genome. That yeah, may be one of the most interesting things to come out of this whole event, is yes. that paper. Yeah. I think you're right, because Steve Goff has said the extent to which that happened had been moderately appreciated, but this really nailed it. That you can, if you pass tumors in nude mice, in various tumors, you can probably pull out retroviruses of different sorts that are adapted to the tumor. They just pop out of the, the mouse genome. And it also showed um, how widespread these things can become in a laboratory environment, even when they're supposed to be handled under under some degree of containment. Right. Um, where you have you have cell lines, multiple cell lines that were then subsequently infected with this thing, and now kind of the presumption is if you've worked with cultured cells, you probably have XMRV somewhere in your lab because yeah. it's just it's spread all over the place. Well, in fact, this prostate cell line was infected, but many people who worked with it didn't know it. Right. Until, <clears throat> right. until later. Uh, it was a, it, during this story that it that came out that this prostate cancer cell line was, in fact, producing XMRV. Right, but then that spread to other yeah. cell lines quite easily, apparently. And then our last episode was 150, called Contaminated, um, which was uh, our re- recounting of the partial retraction of the science paper by the authors. Right. They retracted basically the nucleic acid work because they found that it was contaminated with an XMRV plasmid. Which pretty much gutted the paper. Right, because what was left was serology and some culture, which was not specific for XMRV. Right. Now, up to now, we're saying XMRV meaning a very specific virus. It is not a generic term. So now you say or we concluded XMRV can't infect people because it was generated in the lab in the 1990s. So if you want to say it causes CFS, it's not possible because CFS has been around a lot longer. And then suddenly the discussion turned to, well, maybe it's a related gamma retrovirus. And right, because that, 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 the, the low and alter paper had come out shortly after the original 2009, which found not XMRV but murine-like retroviruses right. in CFS. But XMRV is out of the question. I see a lot of comments online where people say, well, why couldn't it be a related virus? It could be a related virus, but it's not XMRV. And there's there's no evidence that it's XMRV or any related virus up till now. And the only evidence for... This brings up this weird reasoning thing where you get it into your head that it's a retrovirus and you can't get it out i mean if it's not xmrv it doesn't mean that it's possibly another retrovirus you're starting right. over yeah this- an, an error does not suggest anything right an right. error tells you that you wasted some time uh so that the and the only the only group that had found any other murine like retrovirus in cfs was low and alter and i think we're going to talk about that in a right. moment and the other aspect of x of uh, number one 50 was the Blood Working Group report. Yes. That was also published, which basically they had 
collected some of the original XMRV positive and MLV like positive samples, blinded them, and sent them out to nine different labs. And basically, no one could find any XMRV or serology or virus culture, with the exception of, uh, I think, WPI, which had a contamination problem. And, and uh, Rossetti's lab at NIH. Right. Right. And those labs could not distinguish um, the CFS from the control samples. Yeah, right. So the, the test was a coin toss, which meant that the test that had been marketed and sold to patients uh, for XMRV was meaningless. In that uh, study, included some of the samples from the low altar study. And right. those were negative. And it's in low altar, the low lab, which is an FDA lab, was one of the labs involved in the testing, and they were negative as well. On right. their own so they, samples. They could not subsequently detect their own virus right. in their own samples. And so that was our last TWIV. And since then, um, if this were a normal TWIV episode, we'd be talking about the two retractions of the past week, I suppose, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, last week, Science retracted the 2009 paper. Uh, Bruce Alberts, the editor-in-chief, saying, you know, the, the authors have agreed to retract, but they can't agree on the language. And uh, there are so many problems with this that I'm retracting it. Yeah. And one of them, of course, is that one of those figures, was it figure two, uh, Alan? Uh, I forget which figure what? number it was, but there was extensive discussion on this. One of the figures in the science paper subsequently showed up in a presentation uh, that one of the authors gave at a conference, but with different labels. Yeah. Same gel, different labels, which <clears throat> could be an error, but it certainly drew a lot of attention to that figure and scrutiny to that figure. And it turns out that um, the authors then came forward and, and said that, in fact, uh, what was shown in that figure in the paper was not exactly the way the experiment was done, and that makes a material difference in the conclusions. They never had a good explanation for why. I, I'm no, putting I, that I, I, looked at their like <laughs> I looked at their explanations, and it didn't make any sense to me. No, it really doesn't. The, there's no... Uh, I, I'm not going to say what this, <laughs> what this implies, but it's just... Uh, Things were really fishy with the data. I think when you're doing something like this, well, in all science, you have to be careful. But if you're going to do something that impacts patients directly, you should really, really be careful. Especially if you're going to start selling things. Um, so this, in my view, it takes all confidence away, scientific confidence from uh, that group in that paper. So if anyone has any um, confidence in it anymore, I think it's misplaced. Yeah. Yeah, the, the inability to reproduce the results and all the other findings that the XMRV is a contaminant and so on was enough to to justify a retraction of this paper, I think. But the... Um, you know, the final straw and the reason I think it was an editorial retraction rather than an author's retraction was this uh, this fishiness with yeah. the f Now, many people online are holding on to that. Well, the authors didn't retract it, so it's still good. But no. No, it's not still good. No, it just means, it just means <laughs> the authors can't get their minds around the fact that the study is, is completely flawed. And uh, just... Um, and, and bear in mind, you yeah. know, Andrew Wakefield never retracted his paper. Yeah, well, he still has many... Supporters, right? He still has many report, supporters and makes a substantial amount of money from from promoting this concept, and uh, you know, so he's never going to retract that, even though the paper has been the, the concept has been thoroughly disproven and and the data have been pretty credibly alleged to have been fraudulent. Um, that was Brian Deere's investigative journalism work. So, you know, there's a case where the author is never going to retract the paper, but it's been retracted by other authors and by the journal, and and we know for a fact that it's no longer valid. Uh, I don't know that this rises to that level, but yeah, certainly yeah. this is a this is a report that uh, you know the authors may be arguing about the wording of a retraction, but there's no question that the that it needs to be retracted, that we can't have this sitting in the in the scientific archives as if it were valid. So you think someone will investigate this like Brian Deere did? Oh, Maybe. yeah. We haven't heard the last of this. Yeah. This Why is, not? This is, uh, it's going to take another uh, year or so, but uh, this is, matter of fact, Brian Deere himself might do it. Who knows? 
he's got a history with this kind of stuff. At any rate, uh, no, we haven't heard the last of this. Somebody's got to get to the bottom of this. Particularly given the ugliness that has that has <laughs> followed it uh, in the discussion. So, uh, and finally on Monday, the low altar paper was retracted uh, by the authors themselves. Yep. Yeah, it should download the PDF directly. Yeah, that was it. the only way I could get uh, PNAS. They, I. I don't know what it is with their website. Sometimes they just don't get the links to the table of contents updated properly or something. So. But so, we have a link in the show notes right, directly a, to the retraction. And this is a retraction by the authors. They say, we are right. retracting the conclusions in our article because... And interestingly, they say they they don't find any mouse DNA in their samples, but since no one else could reproduce the findings and... Uh, and they ran out of sample. Apparently, apparently. they ran out of samples. And when they went back to the original, some of the original patients who they had sampled to get more, now they can't detect the viruses. Yeah. So it's a weird retraction because they they didn't they didn't find contaminating mouse DNA, which almost certainly led to their finding these MLV like sequences. Right. Because everyone else finds it. They say we retract the conclusions, and I've seen a lot of people asking, "Well, they don't actually retract everything else; just the conclusions." <laughs> well. <laughs> That's everything, basically. That's that's it. Yeah. That's the way you say it in science. You don't say we're retracting everything. You say we retract the conclusions. I think the the significance of the of these statements that they make in the retraction, which is open access, anybody can. If you follow the link in the show notes, you get directly to it. Um, the, the The statements that they're making are just um, emphasizing the point that this was not anybody's fault. Um, you know, there there are people whose careers are riding on this. Uh, retracting a paper is a horrible thing to have to do, I'm sure. So, um, so they're making the point that you know nobody faked anything. We don't have any evidence that anything was messed with. We're just uh, we don't have enough sample to get other people to confirm this. We can't confirm it, and uh, we didn't find contamination, but we can't be sure. And so we're we're pulling out of the conclusions. We don't believe this anymore. Now, what happens with this story? Well, Ian Lipkin is working on something, and I have a link to a statement he has put on his lab blog, a message from Director Ian Lipkin regarding the XMRV MLV CFS ME study. He says, basically, it's not the Lipkin study. It is the Alter, Bateman, Klimas, Komarov, Levine, Lowe, Mikovits, Montoya, Peterson, Ruschetti, and Switzer study. Trying to distance himself. I thought originally Tony Fauci had said, uh, Ian, sort this out. This was a long time ago now, before all these retractions and, and clear elimination of XMRV as a human pathogen. And I don't know, this seems to have expanded beyond that, but what, what am I to say? Well, I think there was probably some discretion for Ian Lipkin to figure out how to do this, and there was a big lump of money um, dedicated to to doing this project and this was as you say it was before all these retractions and and the blood working group data and all that came out um had had everybody waited for the pending data to come out just a couple more months um i think this study probably never would have been authorized mm. you know it's a, it's a big expenditure to tell us something that we already know um yeah, and if it and if it doesn't match the previous data, the burden will be on this new group to explain why it doesn't match what we already know. Um, this is not going to this is not going to disprove or prove anything. So he writes at the end: there is criticism in some quarters that this study is unnecessary, given results obtained by other investigators. However, the participating clinical and lab investigators and our team at Columbia do not agree. Obviously. Uh, we are fully committed to completing the work rapidly and rigorously. For those who continue to express concerns that this study is an inappropriate use of resources in a challenging fiscal environment, please be assured that more than 85% of the funding associated with this initiative is invested in patient recruitment and characterization and sample collection, archiving, and distribution. So we're only wasting 15% of the money. I just would like to know exactly what's going on here. I don't think we have a... A complete description. Do you think that's warranted since it's uh, NIH money? I think that should have gone through the normal grant channels. 
Yeah. I, there, there's a certainly an argument you could make that we need a set of patients and controls that have been widely agreed on um, for for study of CFS. Because one of the huge issues in this uh, condition, as we've all learned here on TWIV recently, um, is case definitions. Right. You know, this is something that I hadn't really followed until we started talking about it here. But the the case definition for this condition is absolutely crucial to studying it and there are different case definitions floating about so to have to have a whole group get together and say okay this is what the disease is now we're going to get 150 patients who unequivocally have it and 150 controls who are age matched and all the right stuff who um, who unequivocally don't have it and we're going to take samples in identical ways with identical equipment and we're going to blind them all and we're going to archive them that's a useful thing to do but it should have gone through the usual NIH grant review process I just uh pasted in a now I don't know if this is the actual grant but on the NIH reporter there's a <clears throat> a grant to Lipkin this is actually a supplement on top of another grant that's in year 8 multi-center blinded analysis of XMRV MLV in chronic fatigue syndrome right and it describes uh, it seems to describe the project so this is a supplement to this existing. Uh, this is yeah. the North, Northeast Biodefense Center. Right, right. I didn't right. know this had to do with biodefense. Well, it's a way of getting a lot of people together. Yeah, it's it's a supplement. It's a supplement to an existing grant. So they just tacked it onto one that Lipkin presumably already had. Yeah, I guess, um, I guess that's what Congress does all the time, right? Yeah, yeah, you, you put it on because it didn't go through the normal grant channels yeah. because it was just Tony Fauci asking Ian Lipkin, hey, can you sort this out? Uh, here's a million bucks. Uh, we'll, we'll tack it on to one of your grants. All right. <clears throat> well, I, I hear it will be done in 2012, so I hope we hear about it. I hope yeah. it's published, and we'll talk about it when it's out. Yep. It would be nice if at least it were structured so that it would generate uh, reagents samples that could be used to look at in different ways to look further into chronic fatigue syndrome. Well, I think that's what uh, what Ian is saying um, is right. that these samples are being taken in a way that they're going to be archived. They're going to be available. Right. They're going to be useful. Right. They're going to be useful. And and I would I would agree that a that a set like that would be a useful thing to have, but I believe that it should have gone through the regular grant channels and it should have had to compete with other grants. And if it won out on its merits, then fine. Um, but to have this just, uh, you know, a million bucks set aside by fiat, that's, uh, you got to have some really good reason to do that, and I'm not convinced that in this case we did. Do you know what's going to be done here? Does anyone know for sure? I don't uh, know. I... Uh, all I know is what's uh, pretty much in in the blog post and in the earlier descriptions. I, I just see there are some issues with the science paper, as we have discussed. I'm just I, hoping Ian can get around those issues. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Um, these, as I understand it, these samples are going to be coded and blinded by somebody who has not been involved with any of this XMRV story to date, um, and that those that that coding system would be kept confidential, um, presumably with robust security, because you know there are people who have been involved with this story who are now in Lipkin's lab or closely associated with it. Um, so yeah, this this has got to be done very very carefully, and um, hopefully that will be the case. All right. All right, so as you see, uh, XMRV and CFS got a lot of our attention this year, and I think that that was appropriate. Yeah. Because you, you don't always have a chance to, f to follow a new pathogen, no matter which way it goes. So that was instructive. Also got a half an hour of our attention in the uh, yeah. top ten. This is going to yes. take us uh, till next week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to accelerate <laughs> these for the subsequent Yeah, sorry about that. Anyway, we'll be visiting it again in 2012. All right, number two. Uh, this may take a half hour too, but we'll try. <laughs> this is about TWIV 159, the H5N1 ferret and NSABB story. I think in that episode we talked about 
the so this was an interesting case because it was an experiment from the Netherlands by Ron Fouchier. He had passaged H five N one in ferrets and obtained a transmissible variant that killed ferrets. But we didn't have the paper because it was. And being, we still don't have the paper. We still, that was being right. held back by the NSABB, the, the US, National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity. Right. Right. And we discussed how we thought the science didn't justify. Uh, the paper being censored. But in the meanwhile, the NSABB has asked that methods and results be redacted from the paper. Apparently, there's also another paper from Kawaoka's group submitted to Nature, which was also under examination by the NSABB. Although, of course, if anybody actually wanted to reproduce this uh, this H5N1 virus that everybody's got their panties in a wad about, um, the description that we just gave would be sufficient to do that. That's right. You're absolutely All you need right. is some ferrets, which are easily available, and an isolate of H5N1, which is pretty easily available. Um, and uh, you can go to town. You know, just passage it sequentially in the ferrets until it's transmitted from ferret to yeah. ferret, and there you go. Yeah, I think you're wasting your time because ferrets aren't humans. Ferrets aren't humans, and there's if, if this thing were going to make the jump to humans, as we're going to talk about in just a second, it would have. So there's so many scientific reasons why this shouldn't be given scrutiny, and I don't want to go through them again, but uh, one of the issues is that people think H5N1 is scary. So I asked Peter Palazzi what he thought. You know, there's a number of 50% fatality rate, which is often quoted, which is higher than most other pathogens. Uh, it's a it's a 50%, well, okay, go ahead. Yeah, read, read, read Peter's response. Yeah. I think this okay, is so he wrote to me, one of the NSABB arguments is that H5N1 infection has a 50% fatality rate, rate, which is wrong. It is 50% of the most serious hospitalized cases. The denominator should be millions. And he sent a paper which shows that in rural populations in Asia, there are high percentages of hemagglutination inhibition antibodies. So that is a test that looks for antibodies against H5N1. Right, so these people have been exposed to H5N1 and they've developed antibodies against it, which says that it's transmitting to them. So Peter says the denominator is probably millions of subclinically infected people. And this is a fact that is ignored by many people, including those on the NSABB. So I don't know, it's probably not anywhere near 50%. Those 50% are the people going to hospitals, but that's not the right denominator. Right. I was going to say a 50% case fatality rate, but that's not even ac accurate. No. It's a 50% case fatality rate among the most serious hospitalized cases. Right. But you don't right. know the denominator because globally we don't know how many people are infected. But the I, think been, I think it's been known for a long time that uh, there are uh, people out there with anti-H5 right. antibodies. And right, and seroprevalence studies like this one that you just linked to, I hadn't followed that literature, but this pretty much puts a spike in the idea that this is the next plague. Peter has been saying this for a long time. He's been citing case uh, papers coming out of China for the last, for looking for, for serology for a long time now. And it's quite clear that these viruses have been infecting people for 30 to 40 to 50 years, uh, especially in Asia. And he's always argued, look, it's had a lot of time to adapt to transmission, and it hasn't. Right. Which is not to say that it won't, but I really don't think that the hype is warranted. I think well, you have to be and, careful. Yeah, and this and this strain that uh, Fouchier et al. have produced is not any new danger. I don't think so. I, th I think this committee is ta tasked with biosecurity, and that's all they think about. And they've ignored the science, and they've ignored the, the chilling effect on science that cutting these two papers will have. And as soon as you say you're on a committee for biosecurity, you presume that biosecurity is a necessary and important concept, and you, ha you have to kind of buy into that. Um, and a lot of that is based on a... a pretty fictitious scenario you know there's a, if, the, uh, if, you look I, at the, if you look at the history of of non-state actors deploying biological weapons it's it's a big pile of fail it's uh, it doesn't work it? i would hope that the nsabb comes up with some sort of statement on all of this so that we can 
have some idea of what went on. Yeah. I, I think we need to know what went on in the group because I don't believe that it was a unanimous decision. If if it was, then I'm really and you know, I have a lot of people I know on that group, and it, you're just ignoring the science. And, and and if it was a unanimous decision, then clearly this NSABB does not represent the scientific community. No, not at all. Because as you know, there are lots of dissenting voices here. We've got. We just quoted Peter Palazzi, and we've got uh, you know the three of us on here who have some experience in this area, um, and, and there are a lot more out there. So, if you want to discuss this, I think it needs to go to a bigger uh, pool of individuals beyond the NSABB. If you want to talk about d- dangerous experiments, it has to be sort of an Asilomar like uh, conference. Now, right. We can't no. just have a self-appointed committee of people right. saying. Now, Kime has said, who's the head of the NSABB, he suggested a Silomar, and he was actually misquoted in the science article, but that's another story. He, The article originally said, biosecurity panel calls for an Asilomar, and then he said, no, 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 that was just my idea, that wasn't the panel's idea. So, I don't know, that may be an indication of how things work on that panel. Uh, it's not a bad idea, but it can't just be the NSABB, it has to be the entire no. microbial community. Yes. And... A or micro, microbiological community. Microbiological infectious disease people. We're not going to ask the microbes what they think. <laughs> it and it's got to be totally transparent. Absolutely, yes. like as Silomar was. Yeah. And, as I, and even da- I talked to David Baltimore about this, and he agrees, and he said it has to be the science and nothing else. You just have to talk about the science. Leave the politics and uh, bioterrorism out of it. So we'll see what happens. But this, I think this is going to be a big deal in 2012. Yeah. All right. How's that? That's enough for that. That was yeah. sick. All right, both Rich and Alan picked the panic virus TWIV-117. Why'd you do that, Rich? Uh, well, first of all, I think that the whole vaccine, the anti-vaccine movement is a really important topic to keep on the table. And I think that uh, Seth Mnookin has done a wonderful job in going through this with the uh, Wakefield vaccines autism thing uh, as his uh, theme. And I just thought the interview was terrific, and I think it really covers covers the thing well. It also has a book that people can read um, to uh, look into it further. I just, I, I just thought it was terrific. Yeah, and I think Seth um, did a particularly good job kind of putting that whole thing into uh, a social context. Because mm-hmm. um, here on TWIV, we talk about, well, you know, the, the, these vaccines are, are the best deal going in public health. They're safe. They're effective. They'll save your child's life, quite possibly. What's wrong? Um, but, you know, as he pointed out, there's, there's a whole culture of, there's a whole sociology around this belief and this uh, contagion of unreason this, <laughs> that's, that's spread. And, and I think, you know, it's important to have some insight into that um, and, and understand where that comes from so that we can maybe try and address it. Because this, yeah, this has a real impact. Yeah, he did a very sympathetic job of uh, looking into why it is that people get sucked into the uh, anti-vaccine thing. So that, uh, you know, people in reading this, uh, don't necessarily have to, you know, they can see both sides of, of well, there aren't really two sides, but <laughs> you can well, see the, 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 the reasons why people uh, get sucked into this. Yeah, and it's not, um, you know, people who have, who have logged on to this belief uh, are not stupid or bad in and of right. themselves. They've just been right. misled. Right, and they were susceptible to being misled, usually because of of something bad that happened to them, right. and um, and and they're victims of this whole big scam that's been perpetrated on them. Um, Much the same as the chronic fatigue syndrome thing. You got a a, a sick child, and you want to know why, and you want right. to see if you can do something about it, and somebody comes along with snake oil, and uh, you're susceptible to that. I was over on Facebook a while ago. Some one of the Twiv followers said, "Hey, you should go over. There's a discussion about vaccines, and it's all screwed up." So I went and had a look, and this fellow was having an argument with someone, and uh, he said, "You know, you should go look at the CDC site. It'll tell you about vaccine 
events, adverse events. And the guy said, why should we just listen to the CDC and the, and the WHO and the FDA? So that's part of the problem. Right. And then they say, okay, the alternative is to just find a website with, with garbage. And they said, well, I don't trust the CDC, so I'm going to find something else. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. But then how do you know what's right? That's it, the problem. Yeah, you have to, if you, if you want, you know, if you really want to go, I, I am all in favor of questioning institutional authority. That's, uh, that's great. But do it the right way. You've got to go, and if, if you're going to do that, then you have to establish the expertise. You have, to, you have to trace back and objectively evaluate the data yourself, and that's not the process that these people are going through. They're, they're just switching to a different belief system that's more appealing to you, and uh, you should be especially skeptical of things that seem to reinforce your beliefs. How can they evaluate it, though, Alan? They don't have the training in them for the most They would part. have to, exactly. They, you'd have to, if you're not um, in public health or, or medicine or, or microbiology, you would have to teach yourself all of that, which would be extremely hard. They need to uh, listen to TWIV. You need to listen to TWIV. Is the, yes, well, the thing is, they will say, oh, we've bought into the, the conspiracy that vaccines are good. Right. You know, they don't yeah, want to listen. Yeah, but you, you have to evaluate that claim, then, and say... What's the motivation for a, a global conspiracy of scientists, of all people, who are the, the – I, I can't even imagine organizing scientists into a conspiracy. That's absurd. <laughs> they, they don't listen. They, don't, they never do what they're told. Um, but just the idea, why would this exist to – Supposedly, it's because pharma companies make huge amounts of money on vaccines. But if you look into that claim, you find it's preposterous. Um, most of the vaccines that all the vaccines in the childhood series are are ridiculous, um, ridiculously narrow profit margins. They're terrible drugs. They're not the kind of thing a pharma company wants to be making, which is why there are so few companies that make them. So it just it, when you look at the conspiracy theories, they just fall on their face. Well, they will just say you're wrong. You see, that's a common uh, ploy. They'll say oh, you're wrong, and then never provide any backing. Exactly, and that's you. You have to look at the value of the argumentation that's going on, and eventually you get to a point where you say, "Well, these people who are espousing conspiracy theories are are very clearly just full of it. They're, yeah. The arguments don't hold water, and as soon as you press them on it, they've got no evidence." Uh, one more thing before we leave. Uh the panic virus. There was a comment on the on the post site from Al, who wrote, loved Twiv and enjoyed the broadcast, but found this interview struggling around the issue of media integrity. Everyone tiptoed around the 800-pound gorilla in the room that mainstream media is a for-profit enterprise. Markets where consumers are also customers can sometimes focus on consumer needs, but the media treats consumers as a product to be harvested and delivered to its customers, advertisers. Outlets that report a Wakefield story honestly are leaving profits on the table because they leave out the attention-grabbing aspects of a controversy which yields a larger harvest. Yeah, I, uh, Seth highlighted that several times. I mean, he was uh, uh, he, he was he was pretty outspoken about the fact that the media really blew this one. Yes, yeah, this was uh, more than anything else that the autism vaccine Wakefield story was a media failure. Um, and yeah, it's uh, we have a for-profit media industry and uh, you can criticize it, but nobody's come up with a, an alternative that's sustainable. Yeah, it's a problem. So um, you've, you've got you've to look at multiple sources and, uh, and, as I say, evaluate the quality of the argumentation. Who's got evidence on their side? All right. Shall we move on? Yep. Yes. Um, number four is the ongoing struggle to eradicate polio. We did two podcasts on this. Number 127, which was called Viruses Are No Joke. We talk about it in that one. Ah, the the um, outbreak in the Republic of the Congo, right? Right. Polio right. outbreak there. And then at uh, TWIV at ICAC, which Rich was a part of, we had Mark Palanche talk about polio eradication. And it is just a very compelling issue because it would be only the second human viral infection that's been eradicated next to smallpox, and it's just been difficult. Yep. Um, we're way past the goal, and there continue to be outbreaks. So uh, right now, wild polio has never been 
interrupted in Afghanistan, India, Nigeria, and Pakistan, uh, and in a number of places uh, that have been clear of polio, it's been reintroduced because it keeps coming from these <laughs> endemic countries that I just mentioned. And yeah. the Congo outbreak was one. There's currently a outbreak in China, which was imported from Pakistan. China had been free of polio since 99. Right. It's amazing. And the last indigenous case was in 94. It's amazing. So it's very, very difficult <clears throat> to do this last bit. Now, if you're wondering about the numbers over at polioeradication.org, they keep track of all this. A uh, year to date globally in 2011, 604 reported wild polio cases. And the year to date in 2010 was 908. But the total for 2010 was 1352. So it really goes up after the year is older, as all the as over as all the reporting gets in. Right. So you know, six hundred cases times a hundred. That's how many sixty thousand. That's how many infections there were, because typically the paralytic cases are one out of a hundred infections. Right. It's not going to be easy. Yeah, it's the last little bit that's the hard part, and that's been going on for a long time. Yeah. So I suspect we'll be revisiting this again in 2012. I yep. doubt that we will eradicate it in 2012. Looking at those numbers, there will probably be you know, eight or 900 cases uh, for 2011, which is good, but not there yet. It's not zero. No. You have to keep immunizing. That's the problem. Keeping on immunizing is very difficult because you're doing a global massive immunization. Well, and that's the fundamental problem with any eradication campaign, yeah. is that you put such a short-term emphasis on it. But this this vi- this disease is hard because one in a hundred uh, apparent cases now smallpox, as I understand, is one. It's a hundred percent. Every infection is apparent. So when you have a case, you go in, you immunize, and right, you can take care of it. But that's not the case here. It can be incubating where you don't know. So polio eradication is going to be tough. Yep. Uh, number five is viral <clears throat> oncotherapy. I'm really surprised that we did one, two, three, four podcasts on this. Yeah, it kept yeah. coming up. So what does that mean? <clears throat> I think it's a I think hot it's topic. A, yeah, it's a hot <laughs> topic. I think it's a technology that is that is matured to the point that it's caught the interest of people like us. Um, it's not really something you can shoot into patients just yet uh, for a lot of things, but. Uh, that's the promise, and, and it has a lot of potential. So a number of these uh, TWIVs that we did were about clinical trials where it's in people. It's being yeah. tested. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did one, purging tumors with Mixoma. That was with Grant McFadden. Uh, that's amazing that you can actually have this rabbit virus or whatever the origin was, uh, a funny animal in South America. Right. Uh, be specific for human tumors. Oncolytic rheovirus in TWIV 131. Seneca Valley virus, a coronavirus in 142, and then more pox viruses in 156. And many of these in people at stage two clinical trials or maybe even beyond by now. Yeah, uh, and phase, phase two is where you find out your first inkling about efficacy. Yeah, so mm-hmm. so far they seem safe, right? It's phase right, one. so phase one is safety, and phase two is the is the first efficacy trial usually done on a small patient sample, and if you find promising results there, then you go to the big trial, the phase three. I tell you, I was I was always skeptical about viral oncotherapy, but I'm amazed by these findings. Yeah. So really what remains is, to, as you say, let's see if it really works in people. Yeah, first time I heard about it, I thought, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the data don't lie. The, uh, the lab results are good, the animal results are good, and... Um, uh, and they're safe in people. So. It, what's really interesting is that uh, one of the key components, there are a number, but one of them is that tumors are generally defective in innate immunity. Right. And that really helps the virus to get in there. It's really very interesting. I find that fascinating. So I think we're going to also see a lot more of this in 2012. Definitely. I will. I will uh, it'll be good when this progresses to the point where they can do trials on people who uh, are not so advanced in their disease. You mm-hmm. know, the early trials are always, always involve people for whom everything else has failed. Right. Uh, right. And it will be nice to see this. And and it's really hard to evaluate 
uh, how good something is going to be in that sort of a situation. It'll be uh, good when this advances to the point where we can see it uh, done on individuals who were in earlier stage disease, get an idea how it really works. Right. In cancer trials, usually the first ones, they, they focus on the patients that are very far, very far along for ethical reasons. Right. Um, and they measure, sure. you, you measure efficacy by various endpoints. And these patients may, may not make it anyway just because their cancer was so advanced. But you, you measure, well, did we shrink the tumors at all? And then you can take it into other patient populations. Mm-hmm. All right. Number six, hepatitis C virus. Therapy and a mouse model. We did yeah. three on this one. So the first was on the new antiviral, Bosepravir. Mm-hmm. It was a big study released in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and I suppose now is out there being used and prescribed, right? Yep. I think so. Yeah, and I think on that episode we talked about um, the pipeline for HCV, which is a lot of companies and a lot of antivirals now in development for this uh, for this disease. Yes, we have a link to the Hep C new drug pipeline. A lot of them in phase two already. Yeah, it's very see. promising stuff. Just the Bosepravir is the one approved. It's a lot of stuff. Yeah, this is going to turn out to be one of these things where uh, before too long. As a matter of fact. Uh, one of the clinical lectures uh, to the medical students uh, this year, um, the uh, doc presenting this was uh, talking about antivirals for HCV, and he said that this used to be a, just a really hopeless infection, and it's not anymore. We have good therapies for this, and we can bring it under control. Yeah, I think this uh, is going to It's follow- amazing. It's a, it's a terrific success story. I think it's going to follow the HIV type of pattern. Yes. Exactly. So he's basing that on just having bosepravir? Or, or? No, no. Uh, I wish I should have looked it up, but it's a number of different drugs. Okay. A number of different uh, therapies that they use. Well, we'll see in the next year um, what's happened with the, with the new therapies, whether there's any resistance problems and so forth. So I, I, we're going to see a lot of data on that, and we'll definitely talk about it. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll see combination therapies yep. with a lot of these new ones. Uh, Twiv137 had the picture of Alan Dove as a dog. <laughs> There's a number of people said it looks like Alan. I did, that's not me, is it? No, but it does look like you. Uh, a little bit. I mean, just your eyes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that was... <laughs> Who is that? I don't know. I just found it online. It's just, yeah, it's just a... Okay. But it's a really good job of making yeah. of humanizing yes. a dog. <laughs> it's really creepy looking. Spooky, yes. It's very creepy. Um. Now this wasn't actually HCV, but I shoehorned it into this category it's okay. anyway because it's a it's a hepatitis virus and uh, in a surprising place. Yeah, and a dog. It's from our friends uh, Amit Kapoor and Ian Lipkin, who found this. It's a virus related to Hep C in dogs, but whether it causes uh, hepatitis is not known. Right, it seems to be a respiratory infection in That's dogs. That's right. That's right. So this is something that needs further study, but is very. Interesting, and I suspect we will see more reports of similar viruses in other animals in the next year, yep. and maybe also what they're doing there. Yes, that was a cool story. I like that. And then the last one was with our guest, Matt Evans, who talked about uh, the new mouse model for hepatitis C virus infection, which was published in Nature. And this allows you to study certain parts of the infectious cycle, just entry, uh, not replication, because the mouse doesn't replicate the virus very efficiently. There's there's still other factors required for that. So it's not a complete mouse model. That's the first one that we have. Yeah, and that's that's huge, I think. Yeah, and we'll see results coming out of that in the next year as well. Yeah, because one of the big problems in working with HCV has been the lack of a of a really tractable animal model. Yeah, just in time to eradicate it. No, That's no, right. no. Just, just kidding. <laughs> Number seven is zinc finger nuclease. I love the titles. HIV gets the parentheses zinc finger. <laughs> Very good job, Alan. Thank you. <laughs> what we do without you? Have boring titles. <laughs> This is a really cool approach where these zinc finger nucleases, which can target uh, DNA for cleavage, 
are used to make uh, CD4 cells, lymphos- T lymphocytes, where HIV replicates, resistant to the virus. It's so cool. And you said, Rich, I remember, if someone had come to you and said they were going to do this, you'd tell them it would never work. Forget it. <laughs> Forget it. Yeah. Yeah, no way. Don't bother me. <laughs> this is a paper out of Bob Dome's lab at the University of Pennsylvania. And they, they introduced these... Uh, a pair of zinc finger nucleases into T cells. They get rid of uh, one of the co-receptors, and they also um, what's the other target? Uh, they get rid of CXCR4 and one other target, which is eluding me at the moment to block infectivity. So the idea would be that you could do this in people. The yeah. zinc. So when you cleave DNA. With the zinc finger, it gets repaired, but then this, the coding region is messed up. So then it's a permanent introduction into that cell. And then cells that come from it also have the defect as well. Really cool. Yeah. Nice there, nice uh, technology. We also have an email about this later on, which we will read. Number eight, another really cool one. Symbiotic Safe Crackers, number 154. This was really great. Two different viruses benefiting from gut microbial populations. Which makes perfect sense, but we didn't know it before. Right. So mouse mammary tumor virus needs gut bacteria to cause immunosuppression in mice and allow them to replicate. MMTV gets coated with lipopolysaccharide from bacteria, and that allows it to, to be sensed by toll-like receptor 4, which induces an immunosuppressive response. Otherwise, the virus is cleared. If you take away the bacteria, the virus gets cleared because it doesn't induce this immunosuppressive response. This is just beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm just wondering, I, I still cannot wrap around the evolutionary implications of this. Like, how did this come about? Well, these viruses are going into the gut where they're the dominant thing in the gut is bacteria it's it's full of them and they're they're swimming around in this milieu um i don't know there was some viral mutant that had the ability to uh to pick up you know had a capsid that could pick up lipopolysaccharide somehow um and it gave it an advantage because part of the whole thing with having all these gut bacteria is that our immune system has to understand that they're okay it's a wolf in sheep's clothing Right? Exactly. So the there's virus, a, the there's virus. A, yeah, there's a oral tolerance to start with. Okay, right. where the your immune system lets in the good bacteria, and so these viruses go in and they take advantage of the same same elements that the immune system is allowing, and mm-hmm. coat themselves with that and get in. Yep. So our friend Connor, who does a blog called Rule of Six, he wrote a comment on this post saying. What about other microbiomes besides the gut? Could they influence other mm-hmm. viral infections? This is only the tip of the iceberg. Got to be. Yeah. I'm sure people will start looking. You know, we got skin microbiomes, mouth, eye, ear, urogenital tract, in, in addition to the gut. So, yeah, I think it's prob- we're going to probably find lots of examples. Next one, number nine was TWIV-126 warts up doc. <laughs> it's our guest, Michelle Osborne, who talked about the biology of human papillomaviruses. What did you like about that, Alan? Well, I liked, uh, first of all, she was a great guest. She was, she was really engaging, and she's doing cool work, and I think gave a really good overview of the virus. Um, but then the thing that drew my attention to it as a as a top story from 2011, and apologies to other guests, I think this is the only guest episode we've picked from this. It's not about the episode, it's about the topic. Uh, HPV was a huge news item in 2011. Um, and, uh, you know, for various reasons, um, it, people have been talking about HPV and the, uh, the vaccine, Gardasil, um, and... Uh, and making statements of, of varying degrees of stupidity about both of those things. Uh, and I think this particular discussion and, and the way uh, Michelle talked about it on the show um, just really kind of put that whole discussion in context. And I, I think that was uh, 
you know, it was one of my one of my reference points for that. What's the problem with Gardasil besides um, some people thinking it causes miscarriages, which is not right? Um, There's this whole, whole whole thing about it, it gets it, about treating uh, adolescents with something that implies that they're going to be sexually active. I see. Yeah, people have yeah, an issue with that. Uh, and some yes. will go to the extent to say, well, if you immunize my kid against this sexually transmitted disease, it's going to encourage them to have sex. Right. So they, so this somehow um, is someone of... We lose him? Yeah. He's gone. This made its way into the presidential campaign, too. That's right. Remember? Yes. Yeah. Right. That was the uh, Michelle Bachman uh, getting on Rick Perry's case because... Uh, he um, mandated uh, HPV vaccination for all of the uh, adolescent girls in Texas or something like that. And she basically threw this at him in a debate as if it were a bad thing. Oh. And, and it was, hello, Alan. Hey, okay. So we start over. We missed what you were saying. So... Uh, yeah, Alan. What were you doing? We were talking about uh, HPV, the uh, Gardasil, sort of s- social political issues with that. Right. So um, you know what happened was some people of of limited intellectual capacity decided that this was going to encourage promiscuity, and so they started getting on a political campaign and making an ideological issue out of out of what should have been a strictly medical public health discussion. Right. Um, and, and that culminated in a, um, a stunningly stupid claim, even for the context um, at the, uh, the GOP debates. Uh, I'm not going to reiterate it, but I think everybody knows what I'm talking about, where a candidate uh, made some assertion about Gardasil that was just completely unsupported by anything. Um, and so I think this this ridiculous discussion that's gone on, um, they, for me, it's nice to, to look back and say, you know, we had a smart discussion about this whole thing on TWIV, and I wish people would tune in more to that. Mm, yeah. Not enough people know about it. That's the problem. Yeah, that's the problem. So a running theme through all of this, I'm just looking back. We aren't finished yet, but I'm looking back at the various uh, – themes or uh, various picks. A running theme through all of this is the public understanding of what science really is. Yes. And uh, this is what we really need to work on. I wish we could reach a broader audience uh, and do something about the public fear of science or distrust of science. Uh, people's misunderstanding of what it actually is and what people are trying to do. Because that's a, a, a significant problem throughout this. Well, why do we all do this show? Yeah, I yeah. mean, we do reach a good number of people, but I think we are too much for many people. We can't be mainstream at this at, with this kind of show. Right. I think We're, one of the things we have to hope is that the people we reach spread the word further. Yes. Well, this is too long and too complicated. I mean, if we wanted to do something more mainstream, it would have to be 15 minutes. Yeah. I mean, we could hit one topic and, and really explain it for 15 minutes, and then that that might work on a, on a greater level. But there are there are shows that do that, um, and the the issue with something like a podcast is it's self selecting audience, so you end up preaching to the choir. Yeah. No, I mean, people have told me, you know, if you're on the radio, people passively listen to the radio because they just turn it on, whatever right. they're doing. And if you're there, they're going to listen. With And you're right, a podcast, people have to select to do it. So that's problematic. Mm-hmm. I mean, we some, maybe someday we'll be on the radio with a 15-minute show, but not with sure. an hour and a half show. <laughs> it's not happening. All right, the last one is number 10, Wolbachia and... Dengue and other viral infections. We did two podcasts on this. One way at the beginning of the year, Color Me Infected, we talked about how Wolbachia, an endosymbiotic bacteria, it grows within cells. It uh, has been adapted. Well, many mosquitoes have it, but the mosquitoes in which dengue replicates don't. So they've selected a, a version of Wolbachia that will grow in 
those mosquitoes and found that it limits dengue replication. Right. Now, well, Bakke on its own does things to mosquitoes. It drives female penetration in a population. So you can use that to get uh, the Wolbachia into wild mosquitoes. Right, because this, this is a, um, a parasite that has, um, that has set itself up to propagate in a population by killing the, uh, the offspring that don't have it. So it's, a, it's almost self-spreading once you release it. And so in TWIV 147, Debugging Dengue, we talked about an experiment where they took Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes and released them in Australia and just did a very careful study to see how the Wolbachia would spread. And it was amazing how what a high fraction of the mosquito population ended up having Wolbachia, yeah. uh, the ones that were sampled within these two small towns in Australia. Yeah, and this... Um what I like about this subject is <clears throat> it combines really cool biology with Wolbachia, and you've got this very, very interesting parasite story uh, using it against a virus, dengue. Um, but then there's also this very tricky uh, public policy issue because this is something that once you release it, you probably can't take it back. Hmm. So we're now manipulating the mosquito population, and of course we joked on the show, well, it's Australia and a species introduction, what could go wrong? <laughs> um, but seriously, uh, the mosquitoes are not something to trifle with. They're, they're the deadliest animal on the planet. Um, and so if we're, if we're now trying to manipulate their biology, this could have unintended consequences, and it's certainly something that the public needs to be very aware of as these things are going on. Um, and, and I think in that case, you know, that was handled quite well, that they went into the communities and said, hey, here's why we're doing this, here's what we're talking about doing, here's what it means, um, and really got people on board with, uh, with pursuing it. I presume we'll see a follow-up to this. Yeah, so... I hope so. The, the individuals who did the release study in Australia said in their paper they're looking now to do a release in an area where dengue is endemic. Right. And so somewhere in Asia, Southeast Asia. And, you know, there's not enough dengue in Australia to make any, to draw any conclusions about it. So that's next. I don't know when that will happen. It will probably take a while to set that up. So I don't think we'll see it in 2012. I'd, like, I think to see that, a, I'd like to see a follow up, just see what the status of the mosquitoes is over time. That's right. Yes. I, I suspect they will do that. Yeah. You could just do it within the next season, which would be this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so come on, guys. We're looking for an episode here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I think that will um, uh, that will provide a good model for how to roll out. This is not the only strategy people have suggested for modifying mosquito biology because right. it's such an important species. Um, and, and I think that will provide a model for how to do that, how to get these things out. Yeah, they did a really nice job of working with the community mm-hmm. and setting it up over a long period of time. It's kind of a yeah. model. I think that that's going to really be useful going forward. And that's the, that's our top ten, and I see we have an honorable mention. I just couldn't let go of this one. Uh, the, <laughs> we already mentioned TWIV 115, but the, uh, the, title, the title track from that episode, Color Me Infected, uh, was about the brainbow mouse um, and patterns of infection. And I, I just... As I was looking back through the uh, the episodes and looking at the archive, I stopped on that one. I said, that is still just amazing. Right. <laughs> That's, uh, so this so, is where they had a herpes virus that, in effect, expressed... Uh, well, you can infect, in, a, in effect, with herpes viruses encoding three different colors of uh, fluorescent protein and then watch how they segregated during infection in, in right so the viruses the viruses would pick what color they were going to be randomly right yes and then um you could watch the the way the colors developed in the plaque and you know red and green and com- red and yellow combine and and all this and you you get this rainbow of colors so the the pictures are beautiful uh the paper's open access people can go uh look at it and read it um but to me that the technology is just absolutely mind-blowing that you can see down to the level of how many viruses infected that cell and right. and, and determine from that um, that there's actually some really 
surprising stuff going on with herpes virus. It's not just every particle that hits the cell can get in. You're limited in the number of, of um, genomes that will replicate, and the genomes that replicate are also the ones that get packaged. So there's a lot going on in there um, that I think raises a lot of other cool virology questions. And they were really cool pictures. Oh, awesome pictures, yeah. Color pictures of plaques. Yes. What I find interesting is now, does that apply to other viruses as well? And I think Right. Other people will be doing those experiments, mm-hmm. perhaps, and we'll see them in the coming year. Yep. So that's be very interesting. So one of the things that I find interesting is as much as we hammer on the necessity for basic science, when you look over the episodes for <laughs> the year and you look over our picks, they're mostly applied science. Yes. Why do you think that a lot is? Of, a lot of, I don't, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it grabs your attention. Right, you like to, you know, as much as we like basic science, uh, uh, you know, it it really gets your attention when somebody does something that cures a disease or eradicates a disease or something like that. I think that's the filter we put. If we want the general public to be interested, we have to talk about things that would impact them. And really, how many viral genomes are replicated in the cell is really cool. It doesn't impact most people. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But new viruses and flu issues do in oncotherapy and HPV and so forth. And I think that's absolutely fine. It's a way to get people interested in a, in a difficult subject. And every well, one of these applied science things that we've discussed has a massive pile of, of basic research data behind it. Yes, true. So when we talk about these HCV therapies that are, that are in the pipeline, that didn't just happen overnight. Right. That was that well. Was the zinc incredible. finger nuclease anti HIV therapy. The 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 amount of really crazy uh, <laughs> basic science in that is amazing. Yes. Yeah. I think it's just cool to say here's what this is, and it can be used for this, and this is the science behind it. You know, whereas just saying this is the science behind and not have anything it's behind is less compelling. Right. But so, we do, of course, we cover the basic research when it catches our eye because. Yeah. These things will become the basis of the next thing that comes along. Yeah. You know, this this uh, rainbow mouse and the colored plaques, uh, or the the using commensal bacteria. Uh, those are basic science findings. But I guarantee that the that the results of those are going to end up doing something useful. Uh, I would also say that uh, uh, in trying to come up with picks for the year, I skipped over basically all of the interviews because I was looking for specific articles and that kind of stuff. But it would have been easy, actually difficult to make to make a list of ten interviews because they were all great. Yeah, so, it would have it, it, we could have just done top ten interviews, which would yeah. have offended offended the seventeen people who didn't make the list, <laughs> of course. But um but yeah, the guest episodes I think are um are some of our best. We talked to a lot of really neat people. I mean yeah. these are just ten things that we think are very cool but everything we talked about is cool otherwise we wouldn't talk about it that's right there's a lot more we don't talk about and this is you know the hundred the 50 episodes are what we think are the best or the most interesting virology of the year yep well there you go rich we didn't take two weeks no not bad okay now we can do some email i wonder if next year maybe xmrv won't be on the list Uh, we'll see (laughs) <laughs> if there's no episode on it, I mean, there there's going to be an episode. On there's going to be at least one episode <laughs> on it, but one. it may not be. It may not be something that we pick as a. I think we have not heard the end of oh, C- no. CFS and infections. Oh no! Oh okay. yeah! Oh, actually, C- CFS and infections. I think yes. that is going to come back. Yes. But yeah. Um, so we may have another episode on CFS and, and microbes, but not XMRV. Right. That's if nothing think. else, yeah. those patients are, are susceptible to yeah. to a lot of things. So just as opportunistic infections. All right, our first email is from Mike, who writes, I have read, heard before that HIV can sequester itself in various cells in the human body and hide there in an inactive state for years. The information I have seen and heard seems to suggest that the virus is activated by anything that stimulates the immune response and hence causes an otherwise inactive cell to become active. What I am wondering is this. Has anyone ever attempted to intentionally draw out the inactive virus by stimulating the immune system and then bombarding the active replicating virus with antiviral therapy? 
So that's a great question. And I sent it over to Kathy Collins, who was one of our guests this year, an HIV researcher at the University of Michigan, and she replied, the so-called flushing out strategy your listener is referring to is a popular idea amongst HIV researchers. It makes a lot of sense based on our understanding of HIV latency. The idea is to activate HIV gene transcription and induce the production of HIV proteins that are toxic either directly or via the immune response. Meanwhile, antiretrovirals are maintained to prevent any newly made viral particles from spreading to uninfected cells. The antiretrovirals themselves do not harm the infected cells. They just inactivate the virus and prevent spread. Limited attempts have been made to accomplish this goal using cytokines that activate T-cells or histone deacetylase inhibitors that stimulate transcription. To my knowledge, these attempts have not been encouraging so far. However, there is a lot of ongoing work in this area, and there's a lot of hope that the strategy will work if we can maximize the efficiency of the approach and minimize toxicity. So your listener is right that this is a good idea, and hopefully one day it will work to help eradicate HIV and cure disease. Cool. There you go, Mike. Great question. Yeah. Okay. Rich, you want to take the next one? Sure. Marie writes, Hello, TWIV crew. First of all, uh, first off, I want to thank you for your podcast, TWIV, TWIP, and TWIM. They make the commute and the gym almost pleasant. It is, however, humbling and a little painful to listen to at times because I'm a third-year graduate student in immunology. I study the immune response to Toxoplasma Gandhi reactivation in the brain. And yet half of the things you say go way over my head with the lay people who write in making more insightful comments than this will be. I often wonder how I made it into graduate school in the first place. So forgive me if the following is a silly question. That is the most... um, profound introduction to this may be a silly question that I've ever heard. (laughs) No such thing as a silly question. And uh, embrace your insecurity. Yes. We're We're all there with you. So, we incubate all cells at 37 degrees, all of them, from fibroblast to microglia. But winter has made it fairly clear that at least my fibroblasts are not all at 37 and microglia probably aren't, and many other cells probably aren't. Per, besides, I'd heard that the 98.6 Fahrenheit temperature was obtained using a faulty thermometer. I know that temperature can alter protein expression, and fevers are at least speculated to inhibit virus replication. Is that right? So has anyone looked at whether small temperature deviations, for example, growing microglia or neurons at 37 versus whatever their normal temperature is, has any effect on cell function or on, say, viral replication? Are there parts of our bodies more susceptible to viral infections because of temperature difference? A quick uh, search... A quick Google Scholar search turned up nothing for me, so maybe it's not a valid question, but I'd like to hear it from folks wiser than I. Thanks. If you want to hear from folks wiser to I, why did you send the email to us? Yeah, really. (laughs) Alan? Um, Well, rhinovirus comes to mind for temperature differences affecting infectivity, right? You get it in the sinuses, but not in the lungs. Mm -hmm. That was conventional wisdom, but the there are exceptions now, but there's still many strains, right, that prefer 32 degrees, the temperature of the upper tract, yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, as for the statement, we all incubate cells at 37 degrees, uh, I didn't for a few months during my thesis work. I, <laughs> I, I incubated my cells at 25 degrees C, and it was not a mistake. Um, actually, I... I hacked together a special incubator to do exactly that. And I, and I found you could grow poliovirus at, at room temperature at 25C, um, but only when it mutates. Yeah. So the virus actually needs the elevated temperature normally, but in a mutation in a non-structural gene um, lets it grow at much lower temperatures, temperatures you'd, temperatures you'd never encounter in the human body. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's an interesting question. I think it's one that... Um, probably hasn't been looked at as much as it should be. So there's a couple of things that come to mind. One, there's a, um, there's a therapeutic uh, scenario, which is uh, flu mist, which is cold adapted and temperature sensitive, and that's what makes it an attenuated virus. And so it can replicate a little bit uh, in your 
nose and upper respiratory system, which is presumably at a somewhat lower temperature, but because it, because uh, deeper in your respiratory system, it's a higher temperature, it can't really spread. That's what makes it attenuated. So I think that is supposed to take advantage of temperature differences. Um, That's right. Good point. S smallpox. Um, the rash tends to start centripetally on your limbs and move towards your trunk. And I've often wondered whether there was some temperature effects going on there in terms of how that disease actually spreads. Hmm. Uh, and although it's not virology, you guys know uh, how the markings on Siamese cats arise, don't you? No. No. no I'm not. It's a temperature-sensitive pigment. Is that right? Yeah. Hmm. So the reason they're dark on their ears and their nose and their tails and their paws is because the dark pigment is temperature sensitive. Yeah. Oh. So they show up dark in their extremities. And, uh, and you'll notice also that as the cats get older, they get darker elsewhere. <laughs> there are changes in body temperature. So what is the temperature of the skin? Uh, that I don't know. I mean, I'm sure it's not 37, but it's not right. it's not 25 either because it has underlying circulation to keep it warm, right? right? Right. Of course, the outer layer is dead, so you don't have any virus replication anyway. I, what comes to mind for me is the old days when we used to grow temperature-sensitive viral mutants. 32 mm -hmm. degrees was always the permissive temperature. Mm -hmm. And right. even wild-type viruses have no problem at 32 and so I think you probably don't go much below 32 in the body unless you're talking about the outermost layer of skin. And so maybe even low 30s, high 20s, I think it's compatible with viral replication. The I other ex got, the other sorry, the other extent, the higher temps are inhibitory. And she right. said does temperature inhibit? Yes, because it induces heat shock response in cells, which uh, the effect of that is to shut down processes including viral replication you can't really with eukaryotic cells get that over high 40 degrees yeah. you can't get over 40 you're pushing it at 39 and a half or so yeah we've got uh, always at least two and more likely three or four temperatures going on in the lab because of our work with temperature sensitive yeah. mutants right yeah we used to do 39 and a half for non-permissive <laughs> temperatures and yes that is um that is probably a mechanism um by which fevers inhibit infection so, Marie, it's not a stupid question. Not a silly question at all. It's a lot of interesting virology goes into that. But here's something beyond viruses, uh, Marie. It just so happens that, you know, there, there are thousands and thousands of fungal species in the world, but very few of them infect people. And the reason is they don't like to grow at 37 degrees. Right. Right. And uh, so that's thought to be a big barrier to fungal infections. And so these fungi that are killing amphibians globally now, um, they're called chytrid fun funguses or fungi. They grow in frogs, for example, because they don't, they're not 37 degrees for the most part. They're in cool water or whatever, or caves. So that's a very interesting issue, which we're going to talk about a little bit on TWIM uh, later on. All right, um, Rich, can you do the next one? I just did Marie. Did? I'll do. I'll do the next one. She already forgot. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so Todd writes in Twiv one forty four. You and Dick bantered, saying that the NCIS actors sounded like they didn't understand what they were saying when using technical terms. You will be delighted to learn then that Polly Perret, the actress who plays the forensic scientist Abby, was an undergraduate honor student in sociology, psychology, and criminal science, and had started her master's in criminal science at Georgia State. At some point, she decided she wanted to act instead, so she left the program, went to New York, did the requisite starving actress bartending for a while, and finally won the role of Abby, which was ironically doing the very things she was studying. A good rule of thumb in our house, never doubt Abby. Yeah, so there you go. That had to do with the zinc finger yeah. right. story she had mentioned on one of the episodes of NCIS, which is a TV show that she had worked on zinc finger nucleases. <laughs> Maybe go. we ought to get Abby on Twiv. That would be cool. Yeah. No, she's she's uh, she'd probably be busy. A lot of fun, but she's busy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Rich, I think you should take the next one since okay. it's addressed to you. Yes. Sarah writes, 
Uh, hi, Rich. Greetings from Virginia. So this is a, a woman I know who's a scientist at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. I enjoyed Twit very much. It was great to see a Miller spread in episode 162, but I'm sorry to say that the electron micrograph is not a bacterial transcription. So this is an electron micrograph of uh, that's done by a special spreading technique that I'll maybe get into that shows DNA with uh, RNA transcripts coming out of it, and you can see the progress of the polymerase because there are shorter ones at the beginning and longer ones at the end. It looks kind of like a Christmas tree. And I uh, suggested that it was bacterial transcription. She says those are eukaryotic 35S ribosome RNA genes. I'm not sure the source organism. I've worked predominantly with bacteria and yeast. I will ask Anne and Yvonne, who are experts in the spreads from higher eukaryotes. Old paper from Anne's and Oscar's labs have pictures of adeno and SV40 transcription if you're interested. Yeah, we ought to actually look at those. I look forward to each new TWIV episode and enjoy revisiting older ones. Thank you for the entertainment and enlightenment. P.S. My non-scientist husband wants you to know that he also enjoys TWIV. Well, that's good. Cool. So these Oscar Miller spreads, I did. <clears throat> I looked into them a little more and had some more con uh, correspondence with uh, Sarah. Uh, this is an electron microscopic technique, obviously pioneered by Oscar Miller, who I believe was also at the University of Virginia, um, where you take cells and lyse them very gently in, in detergent and then spin the lysate down onto an electron microscope grid. So the uh, DNA and polymerase and RNA stay intact, and you can see genes in the act of transcription. It was pioneered in bacterial cells, and interestingly, when they had tried to adapt it to eukaryotes, uh, they had a, a, a terrible time using uh, trying to find a detergent that would do this without disrupting um, the complexes. And the story goes, and I've confirmed with Sarah that this is in fact true, that in, uh, in out of desperation and frustration once, I believe a technician in um, uh, Oscar's lab tried joy the detergent that they wash dishes in okay just out of total frustration and sure enough it worked and that's what they use uh, <laughs> on eukaryotes is joy and I think it's even written up in, it's, it's, uh, I believe it's his technician Barbara Beatty who said we've tried everything else why not try joy <clears throat> and the uh, a lot of these pictures come from she followed up with um uh, correspondent. She did consult with um, uh, two other people in her lab, Anne and uh, Yvonne, and they're confirming that there are eukaryotic pictures. <clears throat> A lot of these are done from amphibians, newts, uh, and they the they're pictures of spreads of lamp brush chromosomes. Lamp brush chromosomes are these uh, very actively transcribing. Uh, chromosomes uh, in oocytes, and these amphibians uh, make very lay very manipulable uh, oocytes, and so I guess they make good substrates for doing this sort of study. So, 35s RNA genes from some sort of an amphibian of some sort. Cool. Cool. I had found it on Wikipedia, and there's no reference on it. So uh, now everybody's having a hard time identifying th uh, the actual yeah. guy but it's uh, everybody agrees that it's probably a uh, an amphibian 35s ribosome rna gene you should just show it to the millers and probably they could figure it out anyway that's that's good it's transcription anyway which is uh what, is what the episode was about yeah, was right about. <clears throat> all right our last one is from justin who, who sent this to twiv he writes about a virology blog post that I wrote about uh, the retraction of the low altar paper, which we talked about. He writes, the full, the full text of this retraction hasn't been published, but from the excerpts posted on Retraction Watch, it looks like they probably only retracted their conclusion, not the rest of the paper. See above. The whole thing's retracted. Yeah. That's it. Professor Racaniello, you were quoted in Retraction Watch as saying, with the retraction of the Lombardi and Low Alter papers, this brings to an end any hope that there might be a retrovirus associated with CFS. You were also quoted in the Washington Post 
as saying there's no evidence at the moment that any virus associated is, is associated with CFS. I hope these were misquotes or taken out of context since you do say it is theoretically possible that ME has a retroviral cause, but it seems to me that they probably were not. Putting aside the evidence for retroviral association with ME, I thought you were aware that it is completely accepted by science that ME is strongly associated with a number of opportunistic viruses, such as all or almost all herpes viruses, mycoplasma, fermentans, echovirus, enteroviruses, parvovirus, and virally associated blood and lymph cancers. All right. I, I said there's no evidence of a retrovirus association because there isn't any more in the literature. It is right. theoretically possible, but until we have some data, uh, uh, there's no hope. It is theoretically possible, as are many, 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 many other things. That's right. Nothing has even been excluded as a possibility right. with all this. Yeah. It is no but, more probable than anything else. Right. What I was referring to was the hope uh, ignited by those papers. That's done because those papers have been retracted and the conclusions are wrong. Right. Now, as for your statement that um, science has accepted that ME is associated with a number of viruses, it simply is not true. Your statement is wrong. Science has not accepted that it is associated with anything at this time, and that's part of the problem. We right. don't have a strong association, and we don't have an etiology, and we're hoping that future studies will address that. It would not be at all surprising if these patients had opportunistic infections, because people who you know, are not carrying out the daily functions of their lives and are and are fatigued to that extent and so on are probably more susceptible to infection. Right. Um, but that doesn't tell you anything about the cause of the disease. Right. Uh, I suspect there might be some infectious triggers. I'm leaving that open. But as I said, that's a hypothesis. There's no evidence. So yeah, it hasn't. It has not been disproven. No. Um, I was but just... neither has any other hypothesis about that disease. Right. All right, let's do a few picks of the week. Alan. Uh, well, mine is, um, this is targeted at, the, at a younger audience, but I have a younger audience here at the house. Um, so this is a show on uh, PBS called Fetch with Ruff Ruffman. Um, and it's aimed at kids in the 6 to 10 age range. Uh, and I have to say that they have hit their demographic perfectly. My daughter is absolutely nuts about this show. Um, it's co-sponsored by the National Science Foundation. And the, the idea of the show is it's, a, um, it's themed like a combination game show, reality show. Uh, so the, the kids who star on it are all um, sort of tween age, um, 12, 13 years old. Um, and they get sent on, to, on different um, activities, quests that they have to go on to accomplish particular things. Um, and on each episode, there's generally um, one sort of um, uh, artistic type of, of activity that some of the kids get sent off to and one, sort, uh, one scientific activity that some of the kids get sent off to. Um, so, you know, they might have to go to an aquarium and find out how to do a physical exam on a, uh, on a beluga whale. Uh, and so as a part of that, they learn all this neat biology about marine mammals and, and uh, you know, how can you tell they're mammals and all this sort of thing. Uh, and there's a lot of science teaching that goes on, but of course it's slipped in through this, um, through this show that's very entertaining. Um, so it's a lot of fun, and uh, if you have uh, a kid in that age range around the house who hasn't already demanded to see this show, you probably ought to turn it on. Hmm. NSF, Excellent. Huh? That looks good. Uh, we're trying to get NSF to support TWIV. They ought to. Writing a grant at the moment. Thank you, Alan. Rich? Very quickly, I just want to plug um, the second edition of Nick Atchison's Fundamentals of Molecular Virology. Uh, I've picked this before, uh, but it was the first edition. The second edition was just published this fall. So it's uh, more up-to-date. Having been, you know, being a newer edition, and they've added uh, more color in the illustrations and et cetera. This occupies uh, a fairly, uh, I don't know, special, but a, a particular niche in virology uh, as textbooks go, because it's targeted towards advanced undergraduates or 
very beginning graduate students. The chapters are fairly easy to read. It's fairly straightforward. It's based on Nick's uh, long-standing experience as a teaching a virology course uh, at McGill. So if you're looking for a fairly uh, low-key virology book but that doesn't miss much of the essentials, this is a good book. Yeah, I got my copy last week. Ah, okay. It You're has, ahead of me. It has pictures by our friends at Viral Zone in it. Oh. Yes, good. Really nice. You know, yes. The, the ones that you were working on yes. some time ago. So he's used some of those. It looks really good, the illustrations. Right. I've been corresponding with those guys at Viral Zone to um, polish the uh, pictures of uh, pox viruses. And mm -hmm. I've, uh, I'm using one of their figures uh, uh, in Fields Virology. Those guys are really good. Yeah. No, they look good. So great. Uh, I have two picks, which are both uh, blogs that have year-end reviews. The first one is Connor Bamford's Rule of Six. He has 2011 or 2011 in virology at Rule of Six, his 10 top stories. And he just started blogging this year, so it's kind of interesting to see. He's picking them according to uh, the number of views. So check. That's different from what uh, we do here, of course. And the other one is at a blog called Contagions by Michelle Ziegler, and she picks the top 10 most viewed as well. She writes about um, epidemics of infectious diseases of all sorts from sort of a historical perspective. So check those two out. Great. Those, those are two, two nice sites. Very yeah. nice. We have a couple of listener picks. Uh, one is from Garen. I want to wish you a happy holidays. I was also hoping to submit another science pick of the week for your show. It It is a trillion frame per second video. All right. Uh, it's talking about how they do this. Tr trillion frames per second. This was really cool. Uh, yes. Amazing. He says, let's just say that I'm still looking for my jaw under my desk as I type this. This is perhaps the coolest science article that I have read this entire year. Cheers. So that's very good. Uh, the next one is from Judy. Hi, Twiv, Twim, and Twip, persons of note. Howard Hughes Medical Institute has a new video magazine, iBioMagazine.org. Right up your alley. You'll enjoy these, and they are short enough to use in the classroom or a meeting. They are short 15-minute talks. So Judy is a high school teacher and FOT, follower of Tui VMP, <laughs> FOT. You've heard from. Me. I uh, I listened to one of these uh, on evolution, and it was outstanding. It's very good. good. This is a nice site. Cool. And our third one figured it was the end of the year. We have three. Is from our friend Ricardo in Portugal, who sends the eleven best science books of 2011 according to Brain Pickings. And the top one is The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, the story of Gila Cells. So that's pretty cool. So we have a best of theme in our picks this week, which yeah. is appropriate. Absolutely. And that will do it for the last twiv of 2011. Although when you hear this, it will be 2012. You can find us on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace, at microbeworld.org, and, of course, at twiv.tv. If you do use iTunes and you're new to Twiv, uh, leave us a short review there on the site. It helps keep us visible so more people will discover us. As you've heard, our goal is to, to teach the public about viruses. So the more people who listen, the better we can accomplish that goal. And do send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. I do believe that our next episode or two will be an all-email episode. So if you've got anything pressing, send them in. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. Thanks for joining us today, Alan. Always a pleasure. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida, Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. You're quite welcome. Always a good time. And you can go back to your offspring now. Wake them up. I will. Have fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank all of the participants in TWIV for the past year, and of course, everyone who've been listening. Happy New Year to all of you. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV. 
is viral. <laughs>